Well, as Daniel said, uh, I am a senior now at Free Harbin, and uh, I'm studying with actually a degree in fine arts with an emphasis in graphic design. So I, I put on a little bit of everything in the arts. Um, but definitely one of my big interests is storyboarding. One of the big things I'd like to do is do storyboard art or first draft art uh, for Disney and do their part of their animation team. So, uh, you know, Daniel and I had been talking about how that was kind of one of my interests and said that uh, some guys here had some interest in that. So um, we'll try to try to get a, a, a nice basic overview of kind of what storyboarding in everyday life is like. So uh, let's get started with talking a little bit about imagery and the eye. And this is really just you know basic stuff um, most people would, would know. Uh, but one of the great quotes I found is, our eyes do not see, but we see with our eyes. And what's really interesting about this is uh, it, it's just so perfect in the fact that uh, everything in everyday life that we look at is not necessarily how it should be seen. Um, the way that we perceive an object around us is not by the object itself, but how light reflects off the object. Pretty basic stuff. You can learn that in any science class. Um, but there's this trick that our brain does with the light that we have. And when we view images, they're not necessarily there. Now, an object may be there sitting there in plain sight, but the way we view something is not necessarily the way that it should be viewed. For instance, Many people have found objects in their grilled cheese. In this case, the Virgin Mary was found in this lady's grilled cheese. Oh, yeah. So uh, it, it's not necessarily there, but because we have the basic shape of a human's face, and because we have the placing in certain areas where shadow should be on a human's face, our eyes trick us into saying, well, there's a face sitting right there on that grilled cheese. Now, there's not really. You know, any artist could tell you that the reason that that's there is just because the shading looks just about right and the contour looks just about right. So, and then of course we have different things like illusions that we see. Uh, we see a depth field we, uh, right here in the way the artist has rendered this chalk drawing, but it's not really there. The first time I've ever seen a hot tub with an escalator. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is actually just a, a chalk drawing of a. Uh, an escalator going down into, I, I, you know, I'm not really sure, I think it's a, an image from South Africa the guy had been trying to uh, emulate. So, but yeah, yeah, it's just one of those really interesting things that you, your brain just plays this trick on you, but you don't see it as a trick. Nobody sees it as a trick, it's just the way we do it. So, you know, really basic, quick overview of, of how our eyes work, you know. So, let's get in to the nitty gritty of it. How do I story? All right. So this is one of my favorite storyboards. It's from Toy Story 3. And um, one of the really neat things about it is if you notice, um, if you've seen Toy Story 3, this looks nothing like the original, uh, the, I'm sorry, the final bear that comes out. The characters look nothing like they do. It's just to give somebody an idea of how things move and how things act in the scene. And that's basically what storyboarding is. Storyboarding would be defined as the act of drawing out a sequence of events so that way you can under, better understand what happens. Now in uh, any kind of animation, any kind of movies that you do, uh, you do it specifically so you can understand how a scene should be shot, how the actor should react in different scenes, or how the animator needs to think about motion happening from scene to scene. You usually set it up where you're not doing frame by frame um, as you would a you know, finished animation, but you set it up where you're doing frame by, I guess, every 10 to 15 frames, so that way you just get a good idea of how things are going. So, some of the things that this is important about is that storyboarding is just another form of brainstorming. And a lot of brainstorming concepts you know, help people to think about different ideas and different things that they can change. But the reason that this one is different is because it helps you visualize what is actually going on. Uh, if I just sat around with you guys and said, okay, you know, let's, uh, let's brainstorm a little bit about uh, why grass is green. Uh, and we start talking about it and we start trying to figure out, well, it could be this or that. But if we sit down and kind of draw out how grass grows and, and why it, it grows in the first place, we can start saying, well, you know, I'm, I'm noticing 
when you drew this, that there's there seems to be streams running through that leaf, that blade of grass. Could there be something in there that could be the reason that that is turning green? And you can start, you know, start thinking, well, okay, because you're seeing this, you're starting to internally, your brain is saying, you're looking at everything and trying to figure out why you should be able to do the things that happen. So then you have um, a, a timeline, which is really, really basic idea of storyboarding. Um, for instance, if we're going to be talking about the shuttle's uh, path, what we're going to do is we're going to storyboard and we're going to say, well, it's going to move out and we're going to start looking at, um, you know, moving it from the, out from the heat. Is it the UVB? Is that right? OPB. OPB. And uh, moving it out and getting it ready for launch. And then we're going to start running through the test sequences. And now we're going to start turning on the thrusters. And every time you do something, you're going to add on to your storyboard to start seeing. Okay. And you, VAB. VAB. Yes, thank you. Uh, so you can start understanding, better understanding, what exactly uh, is, is happening throughout every single thing. The final thing about how to storyboard that's very important is that it's simple images. Now, I don't expect myself or any of you guys to do things like this. You know, these are people who've been storyboarding for years, who are animators, or past animators who've done final animation. What is required in storyboarding is a image that you and your fellow human beings in the room understand. If your fellow human, human beings understand a triangle, draw a triangle. That's all it takes. But storyboarding is just the, uh, trying to get across ideas. A few things you need to catch about simple images. Number one, use arrows for any motion that happens in the scene. Now, this is a, a little clip I found from somebody's storyboard. And you can notice that any time motion happens in the scene, they have an arrow. Because you don't want to draw out every single thing that happens step by step. That takes too much time, and it doesn't help the creative process. So you start drawing out scene by scene, or not scene by scene, but every few scenes, what's going to happen, and use arrows to direct your motion. The second thing you want to do is that you want to write notes under your images. This is really good for uh, cinematography because you can start talking about what lines are being said in each scene. However, if you're using it for something like trying to figure out what exactly is going to be happening with the space shuttle, you can start writing down uh, specific formulas that you need to know that are going to happen with uh, the space shuttle. You can talk about uh, specific um, commands that are going to be going on between uh, headquarters and the astronauts inside. You can talk about those things that help you understand storyboarding just that, or understand what's going on with the storyboard that much. So before we move on with that, are there any questions about any of that stuff? All right. So let's talk a little bit about why should I store it? Why is it important for engineers and programmers and, and everybody that works out here that's not a graphic designer, not an animator, to store it? You know, why, why am I even in here talking about store it? So like I've mentioned, storyboarding is a great uh, brainstorming tool. It helps everybody uh, get a little more creative and start visualizing what all is happening. The first thing that it helps people do, though, is it helps put their task in perspective. If, uh, if I'm talking to a team and I'm saying, you know, we're going to start working on this movie and we're going to start trying to get here, uh, Jerry, I need you to come up with a character that looks like um, kind of like a mix between a ladybug and a tiger. And I need you to uh, get that to me and uh, you know, just whatever, that'd be great, and move on with the meeting. Then Jerry has absolutely no clue why that character is important at all. If you start storyboarding that character and Jerry comes up with a quick draft and says, well, you use this in the storyboard, and you start piecing it together, Jerry may later understand that that character, that ladybug, does not need to look so feminine, it needs to look more masculine because it's actually a male ladybug. It's actually, you know, very fierce in the story. In our everyday life and using things for work and such, as you start storyboarding, you start putting people's jobs in perspective. 
if somebody you've just hired is doing a short programming process for you, and they start saying, uh, okay, you know, boss, what do I need to do? And you say, well, I have this short piece of code I need you to write. Uh, it's going to be used in the new SLS system. Um, just get it on my desk by Monday. You know, that guy, though he's new and he's probably pepped up about working here, he has absolutely no clue what's going on. He has no reason why he's writing that code. You put it in perspective when you start sitting down and saying, okay guys, we're writing a code so that when, uh, when the new SLS system takes off, that we are working on some thrusters on the side that keeps it from going off balance as it takes off and ripping apart. So, uh, I need uh, the new guy, I need you to write a code that tells the uh, thrusters that we're building, I need you to tell it when it's off. I need you to tell that when it turns on and when it turns off. That's all I need you to do. But he can start seeing why that's important. Because if the thruster's off, it's all going to be off. So it puts people's jobs in perspective. Second thing it does is it allows for visual problems. If you, in the same situation, tell him that, okay, look, I'm going to need you to do this off-on project, and uh, you start drawing it out, he says, uh, now wait, actually, uh, Tony's working on a similar project that tells the main engines when to turn on and off. The problem is they're running on the same system, which wouldn't happen, but in this case, let's say it's, you start drawing it out, and it happens that they're running on the same system. He says, they're going to get crossed it's going to start turning everything off. And then we're going to have a huge problem. You might not have caught that problem. You might have just been passing on work to, to other people to try to get things done that they caught. So that's another reason that, that people should storyboard is it allows for visual problems to come up and people start talking about what really needs to happen in our everyday work ethic. Finally, we have individual realization. And this one is a little strange. Uh, but the way this one works is that when we're storyboarding and when we're talking about uh, our projects, if I sit down with you guys and say, uh, we're working on an SLS project, and uh, here's what's going to happen with it, um, and uh, it's going to take off, and it's going to release the capsule, and we're going to go here and there, and then we're going to come back to Earth, and uh, okay, that's the project we're working on. Let's start talking about uh, your project. That guy knows sort of what's going on, but he has absolutely no clue what it's actually going to look like in the end. When you start storyboarding, you give people the idea of what actually is going on. With giving the timeline and giving the, the visual representation, people start better understanding what the big picture is. Now, when you put it in perspective for somebody, you put their specific job in perspective. When you give them individual realization, they start understanding what everybody's job is and how their job fits in conjunction with everyone else's. So that's really important because you start really getting into the nitty gritty of what everybody is doing and why you have a purpose in what you're doing. And one thing that you can talk to, to a lot of different psychiatrists about and you can talk to a lot of different um, counselors about is that if you don't realize what your perspective is, what you're doing, you're not going to be as intrigued to do what you're doing. You're going to be really bored with your job, and you, you really want to understand what's going on and why you're there working. So before we move on from why should I storyboard, do we have any questions about this? Mm -hmm. That sounds like a neat way to do like a con ops around yeah. here. Yeah. Because they're painful to read, and you don't really... <laughs> you don't get it by reading it. Yeah, you really don't get it by reading it. It's a, a technique that's also used in user experience and user interface design. Yeah. Yeah. You say, we define a persona, which is not any one person. But you say, okay, we've got a console, a control room console operator, and this particular operator, we got one type of guy who's fresh out, he's all charged up, he doesn't have quite the same depth of experience right. as maybe maybe our 40-year-old mid-career mid professional. Right. And we characterize that, and then we say, we, we draw him in different settings doing what he does. And, uh, you know, yeah. and, then, and then from there you say, okay, now I understand how this guy's operating. Right, right. Yeah. That yeah. concept of operations, they, um, yeah, you know, a lot of times they say, what's a day in the life of this project? And you kind of get the, the nominal 
that would be so much better in drawings or you know something that get just probably a few pages, you know, yeah. as opposed to forty pages of after you <laughs> of turn text. off the switch, you know, it's a terrible way to run. And in perspective, right? I have to tell you that's kind of the systems perspective. The systems, okay, how does this thing? Yeah. Yeah. If you, if you'll, this is a little bit of a bunny trail, but a very relevant one, and a technique that I learned from a guy who, who taught Apple courses in system engineering before they had Apple. His name was Richard Evans. He said, take a situation you either want to explain to somebody or one that you're stumped on. Mm -hmm. Okay, you're trying to describe how something fits. Draw three axes, and then you let you X, Y, and Z, and then you say, well. If I were going to describe this as a three-dimensional space, what would I name these axes? And if I did, would I be able to describe any point in that space and have it be relevant? I did one of these for control room ergonomics. And I think I said you have, um, what you had, you had your user interface type stuff. You had uh, environmental. Okay, and then you had the room layout, or you, something like that. Yeah, uh, and then in user interface, I said, well, you've got the, you know, you just take this one and break it down three more times. I've got the displays, uh, or rather, I've got. Um, well, I can't remember exactly how I labeled it. And then the neat thing is, you look at that, and if you're not comfortable, if you, if, if two of those axes are too close to being the same thing. You erase one of them and you make up a new one. It ain't no root canal. And, I, and really, this has been very useful in sometimes when you get in a log jam, you say, all right, yeah. suppose I we're going to describe this as a 3D space. What would I call it? And then you, you either find something that works or you say, well, I'll need to work on that later. I've, I don't know why I've used this for years. Just the other day, I started thinking, gee, what if I were going to do that in polar coordinates? Would that work? <laughs> Damn engineers. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things that uh, that you brought up that's really interesting that I, re I really like is uh, that with that and, and any kind of visual representation that you do, you can use visual representation across the board. You don't just have to use it in a timeline situation. You can use it, as you mentioned, for somebody new that's coming in and trying to explain to them how things go or how somebody else who they're filling in for has worked and how they have worked before. When you start showing somebody a visual representation of what they're supposed to be doing, they start coming up with questions that they need to they need answered that they may not think about until, you know, five weeks down and they've already started messing things up. You know? Things when you represent somebody or when you represent something to somebody that's an image, they start really understanding. And I'm not sure exactly why our bodies do that. And why our brain says, okay, let me see that. And a lot of people will say, well, no, I'm, I'm not a visual thinker. You know, I, I do things by reading or I do things by uh, hearing things. And that's true. A lot of people learn in a lot of different ways. But in the end, even if you're that kind of learner, understanding something is very important to see it. Because if you don't see it, you have absolutely no clue what's going on. The short version of that is a picture is worth a thousand words. Exactly. And, yes. a, and a movie is worth a million. Right. The other thing is, um, and I'm, is that uh, speech uh, is serial. It's coming in, whether or not it goes in one ear and out the other, it, it's, you know, it's serial. If I miss it, I have to ask you to say it again. Right. Uh, pictures are parallel. And even text, depending on, on your speed reading, so it's semi-parallel, but it's visually persistent. I don't have to go back and take time to do a recording. I, boom, there it is. But I don't have to do say again because it's in front of me. Well, another thing is, whereas speech is something that can easily be misconstrued, where you can start, I can start saying words that have double meanings, and you can start taking them in total different ways, an image allows people to start questioning what that is. Because if you're just sitting and questioning somebody's speech, sometimes people easily get offended about that. Whereas an image allows people to start understanding and start saying, okay, wait, 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 I don't quite understand. Can you tell me why that is there? And that helps people do that. Any other comments? Yeah, I think you raised a, a good point about the, the uh, persistence. 
because I might not have it yet, but I'm not, you know, I don't want to interrupt you and, just, and I can go back. Yeah. I can jump back and say, well, wait a minute. Okay, we got here. But we have this thing here. What about, how does that relate right. to this? Right. The other, or, the or other side of that things. is that creating the picture or creating the text takes some time. Right. The value, I, I'm speaking of this from the control room environment that I spent time in because I'm building some products for that environment. The nice thing is about, that's not to say that speech is bad because I can turn on a dime for the speech. And I can emphasize something so you know it's really important and you get that immediately. You won't necessarily get that from text. You just mentioned the uh, speech. You know, you need a, a brain processing. Right. It's different, uh, different uh, conclusion. Yep. That's right. The picture or video everybody sees the same thing. Right. So they can start from the same point. Correct. Well, and the other thing is, when you even if you see the same thing inside, people process it just enough differently that the new engineer that you just hired may say. And they talked about this in our intern meeting early on. They said, challenge the people that you're you're working with. Because, you know, somebody that's just come in may say, well, you know, I don't understand. Why do we do that? And you go, I don't know why we do that. You know, like, we've just done it for so many years. Let me go look. And you say, there's absolutely no reason for us to do this. It's actually just wasting space for us to do this. And you start, people start flowing different ideas just by seeing it. You, just you, by you know, the, the classic story about that which enough people know it, you could use it in a room full of people. It had to do with, uh, it showed up in Reader's Digest and I've seen it in other places. This guy always noticed that his wife always cut the end off the roast once he put it in the oven. You know, and how can, oh, I thought my mom did it that way, it must have been for flavor. And it went back two or three generations before they found out that somebody back in the Depression had a very small wood stove right. and the thing wouldn't fit unless you cut the end off. It had nothing to do with flavor yeah. or Eliminating bacteria in that. Right, so, right. Yeah, why is always a good question. Right. Any more comments or questions before we move on? All right. So we talked a little bit about how you should storyboard and why you should storyboard. So where is it appropriate to store? When is it a good idea to store? This is really interesting. You get this brought up a little bit here and there. Um, team meetings are fantastic for storyboard. And in fact, if people would storyboard in just about every team meeting, it would cut, I think, about 50% of the questions that come after. Not during the meeting, because you still probably end up with more in the meeting, but people are gonna start looking and saying, that's not what you told me last week, or this is not working, and people start visualizing it and understanding that. Another important time is with customer meetings. When you start showing your customer what actually is happening, and for us here, you know, that, that has to deal with if somebody from JSC who uh, comes down and says, uh, look, you know, I, I've, I'm you know, trying to figure out how your guys' project works with ours, and um, guy upstairs told me, he said, uh, I should come down and talk to you guys, you know, what's going on? If you just explain it real fast to him and, and speech and words, we've already talked about it, it can easily be misconstrued, you can speak too fast and he wouldn't understand, or, if you start storyboarding with him and start saying, showing him visual representation of what you're doing, he starts better understanding the connection between what he's doing and what you're doing. And so it's, it's really simple. It may take a few more minutes of your time to storyboard, but it helps solve problems in the long run. And then of course, in any presentation you give, which is very similar to, to customer meetings, but if you're meeting with your boss on site here, and he's given you a task and your team a task to do, and you start storyboarding it, then it becomes really easy for you to show him how your team has made uh, big leaps and bounds in the project, what you're doing that can relate to the overall project that other people are working with, and it really helps people understand what everybody else is doing. And that's the big thing that I keep coming back to, is it helps people across the board understand what each individual is doing and helps them spot the problems with that. And we're not trying to create more problems for people, we're trying to create, let, create less problems overall over time. Anybody, so, here, anybody here play athletics? Yeah, I used to play soccer. Not wearing Basket <laughs> <laughs> but, but what did your basketball or your football coach do? They do the little circles and arrows right. to say, okay, whereas when we were on the sand lot, you say, okay, you can go do a down out and right. line. Right. But boy, that picture, they were storyboarding. Well, and, and one of the things that's funny to me, especially 
especially here in the south, you know, we have directions like turn past the old oak tree. Well, that's great, but if you're from the north, you have absolutely no clue where the old oak tree is. So a visual representation of a map helps people better understand where they're going and how they're going. So yeah, you know, and, it's, and in sports, you, you, you mentioned it, people start, you know, the wide receiver might start asking, well, coach, you've got me running backwards. Why are you having me running backwards? Yeah. And he might not understand that he's looping around to, to run back, you know? Yeah. You've got to start understanding what all is going on, and visual representation is a great way to do it. Use those arrows you're talking about. Yes, motion, motion arrows are key in storyboarding. And notes under are key. Though they are words, they help you understand the picture. And a lot of times when you start writing things out instead of speaking them, people start reading and understanding better as well. So those are just a couple of things about that that help you with that. Are there any questions or uh, anything, any comments about when, when it's a story? So I mentioned something I started going in. And it feels like it's kind of a storyboard, but it's, it's not even pictures because right. I'm not an artist. So, what? And, and Terry's probably seen me do this to him lately, just, just within the past few weeks. Is as we're talking, um, something will come up key, and I'm like, oh, okay. So we need, you know, uh, safety limits around thrusters. I'll write it down like that. Right. But then I'll, I, I, so I've always started carrying these big post it note pads. Right. And then I'll throw that down, at a, like I did that in a, in a CubeSat design meeting or something. Every time they, they came up with a requirement, oh yeah, the software's going to do that, I'd write down, oh yeah, software has to monitor, monitor temperature. <laughs> write it note. Yeah. Right. And I turn around and stick it so everybody can see it, and then as we came back, we slept. I've seen um, that done as it's a record of a theme too, where uh, they stick it up yeah. on the book board and then someone takes a picture. Yeah. And it helps remind you of the scene where the meeting took place rather than carefully uh, uh, written down notes. You lose that presence. Yeah. Right. Yeah. What I'm going is not quite in story format, but it does kind of well, relate yeah. into capturing things and putting it down right. on it. And then some I like the post notes because you can reorder. What's really <laughs> interesting or, or group is that people that often look at storyboarding and they say, if I need a whiteboard to storyboard or I need a large piece of paper, that's not true. If you have a stack of post-it notes, you just draw the scene, stick it there, draw the next one, stick it there. All you need is a stack of post-it notes just to start going. You don't even need that. You can use a whiteboard, you can start using uh, a small eight by 11, uh, eight and a half by 11 piece of paper you can do it on. Anything that helps you see the re representation, that's the catch. On top of that, you mentioned that, well, I'm not an artist, so I, you know, I just write things down. Although storyboarding is more effective when you do draw, storyboarding can be used in a note format. You can start writing down what is important in this situation and write it down and then have an arrow on the next one to go to this one and then to this one and then to this one and then to this one. That's another way. It's a, it's a quicker way to storyboard. You know, I personally say that the visual helps because it helps people see and understand. But definitely that is a possibility for storyboard. Can I just tell you a story right there? Right. Yeah, you, you went from... <laughs> I wouldn't call that a story. I see a couple of characters. <laughs> He's either moving or he just broke his leg. Right. <laughs> you know, maybe I draw a big front right here like that. Right. And, you know, I mean, simple stick figure will do it. Right. Yeah, and that's the thing I was saying was that you don't have to draw... This is... I was I was talking about this earlier. This is, uh, this is really great. Over here, this great satellite image we have over here. It's fantastic. I think that's a, a great drawing, and it, it does a lot of great representation visually. The thing is, if you have just one visual image, you can't fully understand what happens in the next three stages of that. This image is fantastic for pointing out things and for helping people understand what is going on in this specific situation, but as you've already pointed out, with a simple stick figure moving from point A to point B of either motion or breaking the leg, 
that one step helps you understand exactly what all this is. And I might, if I wanted to know, what I might do is I might show them standing there. The next one, I did a pretty lousy job showing the broken leg. But if I put a red cross next to it, you know, oh, he's hurt. Right, right. Uh, the interesting thing is, we had when we had this conversation with so many flight crew people. They'd say, look, if I'm if if I have to go through a certain sequence when I'm operating, then fine, give it to me in verbiage and whatnot. But if you want me to assemble something, don't give me a photograph. Give me a drawing showing what's important. Okay? And give me notes that there's if this one absolutely has to be plugged in before that one is done, great. Put it up. But don't give me this big knockdown drag up verbiage. You can put that as backup if I need it, but man, give me the picture. There's a good reason why a lot of manuals nowadays use visual representation instead of just telling you what to do. Get a bicycle. Mm -hmm. It has directions in seven languages. The only thing that changes is the words. The picture is the same. Exactly. Uh, I got a good. Let me mention one other, just an idea. Right. This isn't really storyboarding. It's more storytelling. But the tour in storytelling is so important to getting our stuff remembered and a point being put across. Right. And sometimes I'll, I'm working on a product where we're hoping to really improve. Well, we're trying to use a Facebook-like environment for flight controllers and, and start having them use text chat for certain things. But what I'll do is I'll start off uh, and I'll, I'll say, you know, a flight controller, if a flight controller were Indiana Jones, Indiana Jones has a, has a bull whip and a gun. One of those is his headset with all those voice limbs in there. The other one is his console log. So then I'll, I'll go through and I'll say, well, what we're trying to do with this tool and I'll show, I'll take pictures of Indiana Jones showing there with his bullet in his gun. But then I said, well, what this tool is going to do, it's going to equip him like this. And I show the picture of um, the actor as Han Solo, and now he's got the super ray gun. So you're, you're using a story element there to right. make a point. You know, and that they may not remember all the particulars of the technical proposal. Oh, yeah, I remember a gun bullet, but now he's got a ray gun. And from there, they can remember enough of the concept to get back in touch. Right, definitely, definitely. And, and you you pointed out something that's very, very interesting in the fact that as human beings, we use things that we can relate to to start helping us understand things we don't necessarily understand. That's the reason that uh, a lot of people come up with a lot of sentences to help remember long strings of, of you know, um, different chemicals that they have to remember because it, it's something they can relate to. They can remember that uh, their mother has brought them pizza to help them start understanding what the order of the planets is. That's great, because they can relate to it. But, yeah, definitely yeah. that and, and any kind of visual that you can relate to helps you understand things better. For engineers, a lot, a lot of this is just in the realm of metaphor, which is a kind of storytelling. We actually had a meeting, in fact, it was in, it was in that room. Uh, I'm in a group called Space 2100. We're looking way out in the future. We actually got to have a briefing with the, the administrator, and he'd never seen a Prezi before. He said, what's, a, what's Prezi? Right. And he's looking at it. I finally said, sir, <laughs> PowerPoint is Cartesian. Prezi is polar coordinates. OK, that's all, you know, that's all I need to know for now. Right. I, you know, same type of stuff. Apologies, my chiropractor's waiting for me. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. But thanks. This is great. This is. We need to see more of this stuff, and we need to make this kind of stuff available to other. Uh, be a, this people need to see this. Right. Well, and thank you for your comments. You've made some great additions to my, my presentation here. So. Thanks. It's like free advice. It either costs too much, or you give it to pay for it. <laughs> Good to see you guys. Next week, same time. Yep. So yeah, we, we, we talked a lot about you know the, the reasons that this really affects people in the, in the way that they work. It brought some great points about you know uh, how it helps people understand things. And, and every time we've mentioned something, it's funny to me because everything comes back to the way that we understand things. The way that we we are not people that work by words alone. Words themselves are just images. And they're images that our brain has said, well, that image means this. When we look at pictures as human beings, we start registering something in our background that helps us better understand what is going on at that point in time. So when should I storyboard? As I mentioned, just briefly going back over this, team meetings are fantastic because you start explaining to your team exactly what each one is doing. Uh, customer meetings are great because 
customer better understands what products they're getting, and sometimes they realize that you've misunderstood exactly what product they want. Presentations with your boss is fantastic because they start better understanding how your team is working and how everything is going. And as we mentioned before, sometimes even using it for work appraisals and for exactly what your team is doing and when your boss starts asking you about that and you start drawing out exactly how your team works, that can help them understand that too. That, that just reminded me of a comment when I get, was qualifying to operate a nuclear reactor. We had to stand in front of uh, someone who was an expert in the subsystem and explain how the system worked. Right. And we typically had to draw the system. But the key that they told us there is if you didn't write it down or draw it, you didn't say it. Right. <laughs> That and, and they could end up deducting you points. Maybe you don't qualify on that system because just because you said it doesn't mean they heard it. Right. But if you can point to it and say, oh, look, no, I remember we talked about that. But I think it's very important for people that aren't at meetings, if you just send them a written text of exactly what happens, you know, they're not going to get voice inflections. They're not going to get an understanding of who was speaking at the time, exactly what was being said. You send them a picture of a storyboard that has happened in the meeting they better understand what all has happened because mm -hmm. everything's been drawn out for them. And they can start to say, okay, well, it seems like I missed that you added on this. Uh, how did y'all talk about that that was going to affect what all's going on? So, yeah, yeah definitely uh, symbolism helps people all around. One of the things that, that's really funny, and Daniel and uh, Dad and I were talking about one of the exit signs as we're leaving is reversed in color. It, it's, it's a red border with white letters and a white border around it. Which is odd because as human beings, typically when we look at that, it's white border completely with red letters, which is strange. But that's the catch, is that because the typical norm is white and red, we start you know, immediately representing that with, oh, that's warning, that's, I can't do this. If you see something with yellow and black letters, that is specifically a warning, whereas reds usually stop. You start seeing um, blue on, on side is information. So, you know, you start relating things. And that's all that imagery is, is helping you relate and better understand. All right, so we talked about a lot. So, image communication is all this is called. Whether you're in the visual arts field, in, in any visual art that you're in, graphic design, painting, uh, animation, if you're doing printmaking, whatever that is, whatever art you're in, it's called image communication. In any time that you represent something by drawing, by putting a line anywhere, on a piece of paper, on a board, on a Mac, on a PC, whatever, any time you start drawing or putting down something that represents something else, you're communicating through images. And as I mentioned already, words are also just images that we've decided what they mean. So, image communication is very important. So, we were talking about how uh, one of the, the new projects, the kind of big projects that's coming up uh, is the CubeSat uh, project. So real quickly, uh, we, won't, we won't do a full-blown storyboard, but I'd like to do just a really rough, and this is going to be really rough because I am an art major and I have absolutely no clue about the engineering skills of what the CubeSat is going to do. I have done a little research on the CubeSat, but we'll try to, to do a quick storyboard of what's going on and it, it try to understand what all uh, we do when we, we storyboard. Now, the number one thing is that when you storyboard, that you make sure that your your no matter how you represent your images, that uh, that you come across as um, I'm trying to think of the word that I'm wanting to use here. You you, you bring your images as a, uh, come across as a simple image that everybody can understand. Don't try to sit around and be too complex with your images. Just something very simple. So, for instance, and, and typically when you storyboard, just a side note, 
uh, people draw it by frames. Um, typically, you will see. It's really small. Let's make this a little bit bigger. Uh, you will see. Can't get a good mark here. I'm back here and see if it works. Typically, you'll see a rectangular object and then the animation drawn inside. The reason that people in the movie industry do this is that uh, they want to understand how it needs to be framed up, what needs to be shot. Uh, and they'll tell you, well, this is a extreme close up, a close up, a far away, whatever. Um, but it might be. Let's see if we can't get it to work. I'll move it over here. And we can just do kind of. Nope. Okay, this one works over here. Uh, so we're just going to kind of run it down this way. Um, and however your paper is oriented, as long as everybody understands the direction the story moves, that's fine. So, for instance, we're going to say that. Here is our, our first stage. We have the CubeSat right here. Like I said, it doesn't have to be perfect. I will probably erase a lot because I am an art major, so I feel like, oh, I got to draw just right. <laughs> but we have our CubeSat, and uh, we're going to place it into um, the we're going to go ahead and assume that the SLS is ready to go. We're going to place it inside the, uh, the SLS system. And we're just, we just want to know that this is where the CubeSat is going. So we're just going to put it inside. We're going to say that um, it lifts off and goes into orbit. So there our SLS system going into orbit. So now, now we've already we've established it's inside, it's ready to go. Once we get to so you would have an arrow too there, right? Yes, you would you would <laughs> rocket going up. For the motion you would, I learned you would something suggest here. this one, yes. <laughs> um, next we're gonna realize that it's a normal case. From, uh, <laughs> from inside, you know, we we uh, the SLS is broken apart, and typically you would want to walk through step by step, okay, the SLS is broken apart, this is how it breaks apart so it doesn't affect the CubeSat. But for time's sake, we're just going to assume it's broken apart into the point where the CubeSat is now going to be released. So, CubeSat is now being released by the SLS system, which we're going to draw just some pieces that are falling apart. And so and here goes a little pod off in this direction. And our CubeSat is now in space. It's ready to go. It has just been released. And it has come out. Now we want to talk about how is this CubeSat going to move around in space. So we're talking, uh, for instance, uh, the system that they're using right now is uh, with the wheels inside that allow it to, uh, to turn and mm -hmm. to move around in space, okay. or possibly using uh, the magnetic poles, and so they're, they're, we're going to debate on that. So we're going to say, well, we've got two systems here, all right? So we're going to verge off on a side storyboard here, and we're going to use both stories to help us better understand what's going to happen. So inside this one, we're going to draw a little wheel. We're going to say, okay, it's going to turn fully around and allow it to go this way. Whereas in this system. Is allowing for the magnetic system is it the, it's here, and it is allowing by the north and south pole, and you can even draw outside of your storyboard. People uh, often, if you uh, in the movies, if you want to zoom in on a shot, you'll draw the outside to represent what's happening outside the frame. But you still get your shot framed up. So in this case, you know, we, we just want to focus on the CubeSat, but we also want to understand that there's a magnetic pull coming from outside. So we've got those drawn out, and this is allowing it because of the pull to move from this edge and flip over this way. 
So you know, now we've got this really simple story of what's happening to the cubes at, and somebody's sitting around and they say, uh, "Wait a minute, uh, you know, when we were designing the cubes at, uh, we didn't put space or anything like that in there. We have no space to put that wheel in there, which is not true because they're designing it that way. But they're saying, you know, uh, we didn't we didn't do that. And if you had just sat around and said, okay, so we've got uh, the system and uh, we've got the cubes out, we're going to put the the wheel inside just to keep turning and it'll keep it moving and you keep moving with your speech. You know, somebody might just keep jotting notes and going. But when you start representing it, people start understanding, wait, wait a minute, that has to go inside? I, I thought it was outside. I, I thought it was just going to be on the outer edge of it. So you start, you start understanding that and start seeing what exactly is happening and what is going on with your system. So, I, and we could continue on and go through every stage of what the CubeSat does. But I just wanted to give you a quick little demonstration of, of how it could be effective with, um, with exactly what you're doing. So I have, um, I have one little statement, uh, one great quote that I found as well um, to, to end everything with. Before we, uh, before I close at least my, my presentation, do we have any questions? About anything in storyboarding, any kind of art, anything? Uh, I can't answer engineering questions because I have no clue about it. Uh, but I, I will do my best to answer any question you have. Yeah. Do you have like, some example? Uh, actually, the images or storyboard actually confuse people, makes things worse. Um, there are times when I don't, I don't have any um, picture example or anything like that. Um, but when um, there there are times when people will draw things out. And uh, it will people will not fully understand exactly what's going on. The the catch to that is no matter you know no matter how bad you draw it out or how uh, confusing people get. The the thing is, as you're drawing out, you're also explaining what's going on. Uh, and when um, people, I, I'm not asking that uh, if the picture is perfectly drawn, uh -huh. okay, you use all kind of tools to make the picture perfect look like. Right. But actually give people the wrong conception, the mm -hmm. wrong conclusion. Right. Okay. Yeah, I, 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 I see what you're saying. Um, in those situations... Do you have some examples? I don't have any example of that. Now I can show you... Let's see if we can go back a little bit. Uh, earlier I was showing... This is a storyboard from Toy Story 3 when it came out. Um, and this is just kind of what they do. I don't have any picture example to show uh, how it could confuse people. Um, typically, when you do something like this, it's fine. Actually, I have one. Okay. <laughs> you know the interlace, some images have interlace, non interlace picture, right? So when you take a picture of a moving object, the very fast one, which, when it's interlaced, some object in the picture will show double the one. Right. And people, I have a, this is happening in the shadow space launch and the debris. And the one of the guy who interpret that says, oh, we see two objects, but actually just one. Right. One of the things when you, when you storyboard, especially if you have a fast moving object or something like that, uh, the best thing to do is to only draw the one object and to draw the motion through the line and to use the arrows as motion instead of multiplying the object. If you are using photography for part of your storyboard, uh, the, the point that we're trying to make with storyboarding is even if somebody is viewing that image and they say, I don't understand, there are two images here. He, he actually didn't understand or didn't ask how these images were taken because, because the camera speed or something is interesting. And, uh, didn't get the information of this one, or didn't paint in that one, and interpret the image totally wrong. And he tried to uh, interpret the speed of uh, this object, and the number of objects, just totally get wrong, because this internet seems. Once the internet, then everything is clear. Right, and that's the thing, is that the storyboarding and even the pictures that we use, when we use them, even if they are confusing, the point that we're trying to to use storyboarding for is to clear up any confusion at any point. Because when people see it, even if it is an image that looks like it's double, you know, people ask the question. Whereas if you just said, this is what this looks like, 
and this is how it goes. They might not say, well, you know, it, for instance, if you're working with somebody who's using a satellite image, who's taking at a certain resolution and a certain speed, and they're saying, well, okay, we're, we need to know when this is coming by, and you send them the image, and it has the double image, and they I use it three times, it, it gets confusing for them. I mean, on the internet, they have some uh, picture of uh, the erosion of you, you know, you know make the arrangement and get, let you get a long well, conclusion, right? I, I think there's... I think there's a couple of things that you have to keep in mind. You, when you're storyboarding, you're trying to tell a story. It doesn't, make, you know, that may not, an image might not be the best way to do it. If you're just trying to, you know, that little, you know, sketch of a rocket may be better than, you know, a really nice graphic that somebody, you know, because you're, right. you're trying to tell the story. You're not trying to make it pretty. Right. You're. Trying you're trying to, the story is what matters. The other thing is what you said when we started out, which was you would always put text mm -hmm. in there, which maybe describes a little bit about what's going right. on. Yeah. So, like in our CubeSat example, you know, there's a okay deployed, and maybe there's a step where okay, 20 minutes later, because you have to wait until it gets so far from the vehicle or whatever, you know, just keep out zone, and you would convey that in the text. You right. Know. 20 minutes later. <laughs> You know, right. we be you know, yeah. we power on and begin deorbit, and then you can show sure. you know your wheels or your yeah. torquers uh, right. starting to deorbit. This is what Daniel's talking about. Is is most of the time in, in uh, film industry and in the animation industry, when you do um, create a scene, you use arrows for the motion for what's happening in the scene, but you also list what is going on. Uh, a lot of times in the cinematography. They'll list what lines are being said in that scene so that whoever is looking at that scene can fully understand what all is going on. So Daniel's right. When, when you do uh, fully do a storyboard, you want to use the arrows for motion and you want to write underneath even simple, just simple statements of what all is happening. And for instance, in that situation, if you did use that image in a storyboard, you might want to write that uh, this is the SLS system going by such and such satellite which takes images, uh, it takes pictures of images at this certain resolution and at this certain frame rate. So it helped people understand that it was a blur and not, you know, not actually two rockets that were going by. So I understand that yes, there are times when people see images and are confused, but in a sense, you're not trying to confuse people. But because they're confused, it gives you a better opportunity to explain what exactly is going on. And that's one of the things we're wanting to do is we're wanting people to ask questions so that we can solve problems before they ever happen. And that's one thing that Storyboard helps to do. Other questions? That's a good one. I really like that. One of the things, um, I haven't won this battle, but, but I'll say that whatever it is when you're recording requirements or or a design or a concept, we were talking about this earlier, uh, the way that you should record the information is the best way to convey the information. Yeah. It may be a sketch, it may be a picture, it may be a paragraph of words, I can't think of, but you know, however it is, but we, I think we get really hung up on, I've got to write words, and in section one I wrote you know, paragraphs of this length. So in section two, I have to write very similar paragraphs, but what I'm talking about in section two, that may be a terrible way to describe it. Mm -hmm. You know, it might be that section two is, a, you know, a little storyboard of, hey, this is the concept of operations like that. You know, that's a great way to mm -hmm. describe that. So yeah. I went to a Saturn uh, uh, training session, uh, writing a set, mm -hmm. and the guy there said different people understand and learn in different ways. So be sure and put plenty of illustrations, mm -hmm. sketches, images in with your text because it really helps particularly some people, but it helps overall to yeah. to have the mix. Even yeah. in a in a document like a SAMP, you know, yeah. which is technical stuff. And one of the ones you, you I mean you had mentioned that the storyboards help and we didn't actually talk a lot about, you know, individually sending people storyboards and things like that, which can work. It is a possibility to do things like that. But typically, uh, some of the best things are group sessions. 
may help people all brainstorm. However, taking an image from your group session that might help somebody understand what was going on or remind them, hey, remember in this group session we talked about this, here's what it looks like. It helps them better understand what is going on. And remember. Oh yeah, definitely. And I think one trap we get into, come back to the, the picture and the text and everything, we tend to include irrelevant detail. Mm, and I think a lot yeah. of times when you're doing this, it's like, no, it, you know, the point is not to make it accurate. The point right. is to make it clear. Right. <laughs> whether it's whether it's text or whether it's image, you know, yeah. picture, drawing, or sketch or whatever, yeah. we tend to include details that really don't enhance the story. Right. Yeah. And it, yeah, I think especially with engineers, we want to kind of dump everything right. in, <laughs> and that's right. not necessarily best. <laughs> Yeah. Not, more is not always better. That's, that's right. And you can represent that, that SLS as just a cylinder or, you know, just a rectangle right. even. Yeah. Just as long as people understand, okay, this is what we're designating as the SLS yeah. system. Yeah. So I can't tell you how many times we get the comments on our it's a software design document and it'll have, you know, I want to say pictures, really they're, they're drawings, but... Um, but it will be talking about a certain system and it will not draw all the subsystems. And the comments we get back in the reviews are, you left out the MPS subsystem. And we just, mm. went, yeah, because we're not talking about that right here. <laughs> yeah, there are overviews here. But that's my system, and it's the most important, and right. it should be in every. <laughs> you, know, you did not draw this interface. I know we didn't draw it. We didn't, we didn't intend to draw that interface. Not here, you know. We're abstracting, you know. Yeah. And when you abstract, it's what we're supposed to do. But some people, you know, we, we tend to be that sort of like the story of when somebody uh, asks the guy what time it is, he tells you how the watch works. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. an extreme. Yeah. Other questions, comments? All right, so like I said, I have one last final quote for you here. Um, this, is, this is a really great one. What is the key to success in visual storytelling, a willingness to collaborate, the flexibility to evolve, and the understanding of basic rules of cinematography. And in this case, I like to change cinematography to the basic rules and principles of your project or what you are working on. If you have the willingness to collaborate and talk with people and work out what problems are happening in your storyboard, it helps you in the long run. Being able to see that your project has flaws, the flexibility to evolve, gives you the capability of making a better product and making something that's safer for people. And understanding the basic rules and principles of what your project is helps to explain to people and helps them better understand what everybody is doing. So like I've said throughout everything, the key that we're looking for in storyboarding is that we are we are helping people better understand what they are doing and what everybody else is doing in the project by representing it with images that allow them to see what all is going on. So uh, that's all I have. Like I said, I you know any questions you have, I, I'm more than happy to try to answer. But um, that's what I've got. When I came, my only experience with story, storyboarding was proposal preparation. And you would have a room like this, and each section of the proposal would be mm -hmm. outlined on the boards. And then as it developed, people would put in figures and text, and uh, you know, this, this, it, it grew with time. And then the blue team would come in and knock it, and you'd fix it in the blue team. But this is a, a much more complete, that was one rather narrow application. You kind of storyboarded a document. Yeah, yeah. How about that? Exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. each, each part was laid out and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, beginning with an outline and then uh, filling in the detail, the subparagraphs, and, and you could change it, move it, delete it, add. That's good. So, mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. Fantastic. Great. Excellent job.